Welcome back to Pagan Valley, everyone. Tonight, we are stepping back into the analog horror community and taking a look at a series that I have been watching for a few months now. It is one that has definitely grown in popularity recently, and with its latest video being the longest and most expository of the series, it feels like it's time to finally talk about it. Mount Greylock. It's a national park in the northwest corner of Massachusetts, and a popular hiking and skiing location for tourists. It's home to one of the most unique memorials, the Veterans War Memorial Tower that sits alone on top of the mountain. The oddity of a lighthouse looking structure alone in the woods is extremely uncanny, and even the people at its opening in the 1930s thought the same thing. And the mountain has become a local legend for being supposedly haunted and cursed, but I doubt that entirely. But little did you know that this tower and the mountain are home to so much more, and tonight we will be analyzing the archives of an incident back in the 1980s, one that involves home invasions, viruses, monsters in the woods, fetuses disappearing from their mother's wombs, cannibals, and a government-run research company that wants to elevate humanity to a new plane of consciousness. Tonight, we will be investigating the Greylock Tapes. On January 24th of this year, a YouTube channel was created called Greylock. And for spoilers, if you have been around in the horror scene, you probably know the very popular horror YouTuber, Rob Gavigan, who hosts the Seriously Strange podcast and this is his project. But we will be analyzing and critiquing it regardless of who made it. But we have nine videos to cover at the time of this video, and then we'll start to formulate a story based on them. And as always, if you haven't seen the Greylock tapes yourself, please go and experience them before watching this analysis. A lot of effort and love was clearly put into it, and the creator deserves all the views. There's a link to the channel in the description below, so go get caught up if you haven't already. Now, grab a snack that is preferably not a family member, and get comfy as we ascend together into the Greylock Tapes. Our first video is titled Back Online and begins with a timer set at 13 hours and an automated voice saying that primary systems online. Then the automated voice says something that's a little distorted, but sounds like booting systems complete. A transition occurs and we are shown what looks like CCTV of an office while the voice says emergency shutdown protocols disengaged. We are then told the system went online at 0106 and to contact a technician for assistance. The automated message introduces us to this facility, but again it's distorted. Take a listen and I think it says Simeo USA or something like that, and to access operations but it does ask us to insert our credentials. Primary systems online. Meeting sequence complete. Emergency shutdown protocols disengaged. System is offline for time code 0106. Contact technician for assistance. Welcome to Simeodine USA Enhanced Access Operations. Please enter your clearance credentials. Also, our CCTV footage has cycled through some of the cameras, showing that this facility is in ruins with debris everywhere. Someone or something gave credentials because the automated system says, Error, these credentials are not recognized. 
but whoever has restarted this facility's systems then override the credential check and we are told that administrator privileges are granted and welcomes back unknown user ID and asks what they would like to do. These credentials are not recognized. Clearance credential requirement overridden. Administrator privileges granted. Welcome back, I'm on user ID. What would you like to do? Accessing archival storage form, GBA. Data extraction initiated. We can hear another masculine robotic-like voice faintly, and I think it says either touch you or thank you. But regardless, the unknown user asks the system to access the archival storage, but our feed is cut and distorted with this. Fatal error, offline, contact on-site technician immediately, internal camera B, location morgue. But our camera's feed comes back on while the system says that data extraction had been initiated and begins processing. First to 10% complete, but we are then interrupted by our camera again cutting out. When it cuts back, the data extraction is at 80% complete before finishing. The system begins to transfer the data and says where it's going before the camera cuts out again and we get a flash of a company logo. Turns out this facility is called Simeodyne USA, a strange name that probably has some deeper meaning or code, but with that our video ends. And right off the bat, let me just say how well done this first video is for an analog horror series. For only 90 seconds, this video packs so much information and interest. Most importantly, it has done the hard part of showing us a threat by way of a ruined facility and leaves us asking, what happened? Some minor details we can begin to pick at is the automated system within Simeodyne. At the beginning, we were told that the facility system was offline due to an emergency shutdown protocol. Immediately, we can assume something occurred that caused the downfall of this building and also that someone who must have worked here initiated that shutdown. But why? And also that someone else has returned here. We don't know if this is going to be an actual character or just a method to explain where the next tapes will come from, but let's say it's a character. Then it had to have been someone high on the totem pole at this company because they had the override codes and they extract the archival storage, which might be the remaining tapes. Let's not speculate too much though, and instead jump into the next video. The second tape is titled, To the Mountain. It begins by driving down a snowy road at night. On the car radio sounds like a Protestant pastor doing a sermon. Take a listen. Our 
short video then cuts to the car parking. When the driver turns the car off, we then change to our stranger walking in the woods. They appear to be looking for something out in the darkness, but we are then introduced to a very distorted voice recording. So yeah, on first watch, this will definitely have to be edited to make out what is being said. So I'm going to toss this into the editing room and I'll show you what I decipher. After following the blood trail, our cameraman stops by this tree and says what I'm pretty sure is a human skull. On this tree is this gray or white rectangle that looks man-made just hanging there, but it's enough to scare our driver back to his car. Once back on the road, the sermon begins again and this time he stops. Our driver senses danger and begins speeding through the woods as the sermon becomes more distorted and sounding more like a message. Take a listen, but specifically hear the last line. come face to face with the devil himself whether we intended to or not dear believer we are drawn to him by our own hearts in Matthew chapter 15 verse 19 it says for out of the heart come evil thoughts murder adultery sexual immorality theft false witness slander there is a shadow nested deep deep within our hearts, within our minds, in a place most people don't even know exists within themselves. The devil is going to call to those depths, dear believer. 
And though you may tremble before the beast, you should make it easier on yourself and accept what it is that he bestows upon you. <laughs> The devil has a plan for you, and with that our video ends. While this video is very well done and very atmospheric, we didn't get much exposition here to what is happening. There is a woods with blood trails in it and maybe even some creature that our driver saw. Clearly he was here to try to find someone or something. We also saw some visual distortions and what looked like a flipping of reality with that tree, as if someone was putting a looking stone up to their eye to reveal clues. As for the distorted audio, I originally thought it was just the distorted version of the sermon, but at the end it clearly says Mount Greylock, and this person is investigating blood trails which might be leading to the carcass that's mentioned and our stranger discovers that it isn't an animal carcass because it has a human skull. And based on the quote about lions, it sounds like our stranger has ruled out mountain lions as being the culprit for this murder. Not to mention that they've also mentioned that someone anonymous has hiked the trails for nearly a decade on the mountain. It's very bizarre, but at least we have uncovered some context. The driver is investigating something, some creature on Mount Greylock, something that has the ability to distort his electronics, including his camera, voice recorder, and car radio. So Mount Greylock is our location, a mountain that in my opening told you is one of mystery and supposed hauntings. But let's press on and find more. Our next video is titled Orientation Protocols, and it takes us back to that facility called Semiodyne. It begins by showing us a warning, and we can immediately recognize that the government and military are involved here, with the name of our new employee being Alexander Michael Marsh. We then get this lengthy warning about non-authorized viewing. A couple things of note, we immediately see at the bottom that this video was made by Simeodyne Labs, and that this was only shown to military personnel. With that, our video begins. Greetings, and welcome to the Preconditional Protocols and Orientation video system provided by Unit 13, as part of the United States Army and Project Stargate, created in partnership with Simeodyne USA. On behalf of all of us here at Unit 13, congratulations on your selection as one of our testing candidates. You luckily have a lot of questions, and this video is designed to answer them all. First, let's go over some background information to provide you with the crucial context you'll need for a full understanding of what it is we're doing at Unit 13. We are sure you've heard plenty of rumors surrounding what it is that we do, but we are willing to bet that most everything you've heard is wrong. Being a highly confidential part of Project Stargate, which you've already- I'm going to pause right here because you have heard this phrase Project Stargate, and I just want to give you some context. Basically, it was during that craze of New Age science where the CIA was doing quacky shit like kidnapping people and dosing them with LSD, also MKUltra, and investing millions of dollars into strange scientific advancements. One project was called Stargate, and it was the CIA's attempt to research and develop a way to see through one's mind at something happening at a great distance. 
obviously it bore no fruit, but the reference definitely puts us right in the 70s and 80s. Unit 13 studies a revolutionary and promising area of parapsychology. Thought forms. If you're unfamiliar with what thought forms are, that's okay. You're in the majority. So, what are thought forms? Through the ages, occultists and spiritualists, Tibetan monks to theosophists, have exercised the creation of what is sometimes referred to as a tulpa, otherwise known as a thought form. A thought form is the manifestation of a person's will, emotion, or other deeply psychologically energized state into a semi-physical form, existing as not only an extension of the person, but as its own independent and sentient entity. Thought forms are also able to be witnessed and experienced by third parties, and are not limited solely to the person who developed them. Thought forms have been formed to serve as familiars, companions, or even friends to those who conjure them. According to key literature, thought forms can be intentionally formed by a single person or multiple people, though they can be unintentionally formed as well. But they are always manifested through the deep will and focus of a person in a considerably heightened state of connectivity with their own consciousness. Traditional thought forms can vary widely in their level of influence in the real world. While they usually take physical formations eventually, their earliest stages are more apparitional in nature, with brief manifestations, though most often remaining as an unseen essence, much like a phantom or a ghost. At this phase, thought forms and ghosts are very similar in a number of ways. Individuals can make contact with them through communication devices, such as a Ouija board or through EVP sessions, while the thought form may respond through moving objects, manipulating electronics, or even speaking words in short phrases. Due to their striking similarities, a current theory established by Unit 13 suggests that what we know as ghosts may not be as common as we once believed. Let's pause again. Did you hear that last part? In the list of what a thought form is capable of, Manipulating electronics is one of them. Interesting. So not only can these thought forms manipulate things around them, they even begin to become physical with time and with more experience. Rather than a deceased person's energy being left behind after death, it's possible, and indeed likely, that these paranormal entities are actually thought forms that are unintentionally created by those individuals that the deceased has left behind, who spend inordinate amounts of time in deeply emotional states, where their mental capacity is largely occupied by a powerful focus on the departed individual. In other words, as these are the ideal conditions from which thought forms are born, people may very well create their own ghosts and hauntings. However, as more time and energy is invested into the development of the thought form, they begin to harness more influence on their environment, until eventually exhibiting a semi-permanent physical appearance, and, in due course, becoming as tangible as a living creature. This is where Unit 13's interest comes in. We've sought to answer a very important question. Can thought forms be created in a manner that would benefit American society and help keep American citizens safe? Unfortunately, the practice of intentionally creating a thought form by traditional methods would undoubtedly take years and years of devout mental training. So, Project Stargate has enlisted a world-renowned authority in thought forms, a man named Dr. Bernard Hayes, to oversee a number of the operations related to Unit 13's work. His participation has been invaluable and has brought fruitful results to the project. Due to Unit 13 and Simeodyne USA's combined efforts, bringing together some of the most prestigious minds in the world, specializing in the sciences of the human consciousness, with cutting-edge technology and engineering methods, we've created a groundbreaking, proprietary invention. Introducing the Thought Forum Manifester. The Thought Form Manifester is able to create truly independent and self-sustaining Thought Form entities from the minds of select, willing participants. Being that they come from the deepest recesses of the human mind, Thought Forms can appear in virtually any configuration. They could look like a person, an object, an animal, or even something as abstract as the physical representation of an emotion. That being said, it's recommended to brace yourself before touring the thought form chambers, as thought forms can also take on appearances that could be considered disturbing, like a creature one might see in a childhood nightmare. There's no reason to be afraid, however. 
All thought forms are docile by nature, and while they may look or behave in a frightening manner, and though they are capable of making physical contact, they pose no threat to humans. Once your session in the thought form manifester is completed, your thought form will be securely transported directly into a containment chamber. Thought forms are unable to pass through the barrier of the manifester and will not be capable of causing you any issues. There are some very rare potential side effects that may result from your session. These side effects include increased tiredness, loss of balance, dizziness, insomnia, vomiting, episodes of temporary amnesia, and mild hallucinations. These side effects, if present, will clear up within 72 hours of your session, and are simply signs of your brain recalibrating to the real world. It is recommended that you refrain from driving or operating heavy machinery for 72 hours after your session, even if you experience no side effects. None of these side effects should cause you any harm or overt stress, and former testing candidates who have experienced these side effects reported that they were very mild and merely a transient inconvenience. With all of that out of the way, we are looking forward to your participation with Unit 13, and your time in the Thought Forum Manifestor has been scheduled. However, there are several required mind exercises as a part of this video system that must be completed prior to your scheduled date in order to prime your consciousness and ensure the highest quality results. Please enter the video cassette labeled TF2, waking your subconscious now. This is the end of this tape. All right, so we now have a host of new information because of this video. Simeodyne and the government are trying to create thought forms quickly and use them. They even have a machine that can make this happen. But by the looks of some of the photos, this is definitely taking place in a facility somewhere. Also, we have a name of the director of this project. Which, if you have watched my videos before, you know that there are two important clues when analyzing a series. Dates and names. Dates help us make the timeline, and names provide us who was involved and what they did on the timeline. But connecting this to what we've already seen so far, we saw a bunch of electronic manipulation in that last video. So maybe what our stranger in the woods was doing was looking for a thought form that had become physical. And in our first video, if that was the Simeodyne facility, did something they create get loose and cause the destruction? We are still missing a lot of info, so let's just keep pushing further. Our next video is called Unexpected Visitors and begins with someone walking the woods with a flashlight. They walk up to a window of a home and seem to be looking for someone inside. As time passes, they take it a step further and actually remove the window panel before breaking into a stranger's house. As they approach the steps, we hear this and then our video changes.
like to thank my producer, producer my right, right, writers, my director, director, my friends, and you, the ordinary PP people who made me what I am today. Max Headroom premieres after Moonlighting tomorrow. They did love me. We interrupt our current program at the request of the Massachusetts State Police. This is the emergency broadcast system. This is not a test. All normal broadcasting has been discontinued during the emergency. This station will broadcast official information, news, and instruction for Northern Berkshire County, Massachusetts, after the following tone. Alright, so what the hell did we just witness? Remember how in the second video we talked about some animal-like creatures our stranger was talking about? Well, it looks like he was onto something because the local authorities have put in a state of emergency and are telling everyone to protect their homes from intruders. Also, we were shown Max Headroom, so that means we are definitely in the late 1980s for this time period. So for now, what if we assume this guy in this video was the same person as the guy in the second video? What if this was all taking place on the same night, and he's trying to find proof of these armed suspects laying waste? If they are even human, that is. So this stranger found someone's home and thought it was empty and let himself in through the window. But who was that screaming? Was it someone being attacked in this house, or maybe someone in another home? Regardless, our video ends with our stranger encountering one of these suspects as a gloved hand reaches up as if to break in. One last clue we got before we move on was that we got to hear what county this emergency broadcast was in, Northern Berkshire County, Massachusetts. That county is here on the state map and the north part of the county is exactly where Mount Greylock is, just like our stranger said in the second video. This is Hagen in the editing room. 
so this is an informal inclusion to this video. Um, I'm going off script right now. Basically, while editing, I discovered a whole bunch of distorted screenshots at the end of the last video while I was uh, wrapping up. So I'm going to add them here. A lot of these images are what look like um, monsters that are going to be more present in the future videos that we're going to talk about. Um, that being said, it is very interesting. So I'm showing you the screenshots right now that are at the end of that video. Um, we can see some sort of monsters that we will see more of as the videos go on. It does kind of change my theory at the end, but not by much. Just another potential twist that we could get. Um, some familiar imagery that we can see is obviously the monster-like mutated human skull, which could be a reference to the second video, or it could be a foreshadowing of a future video later in this video that we're going to talk about. The other important image is that of the mask. This is another reoccurring thing that we will see in future videos. Uh, with that, that's all I wanted to add real quick, just making sure that I hit everything in this video. Okay, love you all. The next tape is titled, Not Here, Not Now, Not Anyone. And this is also the first video to have a description, which reads, Do you know what they did up there? These are the consequences. The video begins and the majority of the first part is this blank screen as we listen to what sounds like a pregnant woman in a hospital getting an ultrasound. Take a listen. Well, hello again, Tiffany. Oh, hi, Wanda. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. No dad this time. No, unfortunately, he couldn't get off work today. So I'm going to have to call him on a payphone to let him know all the details as soon as we're done. <laughs> <laughs> He's excited to be a dad, huh? Oh, yes, he uh, certainly is. We, we both can't wait to be parents. Aw, and you said you've been together since high school, right? Yep. That's so sweet. And have you decided on a name for your baby boy yet? Yep, we're going with Max. Ooh, Max, huh? Mm -hmm. That's a nice, strong name. <laughs> That's why my fiancé wanted it so bad. He says it'll help make him strong right off the bat. That's a pretty good way of thinking about it. So let's see how strong little Max is so you can hurry up and make that call. Yes, please. He's been moving around like crazy the past couple weeks, so I think he's really strong. Strong enough to kick so hard I almost throw up sometimes, too. <laughs> Aw, what a wild boy! Activity is good. Yep. Once the machine turns on, we see the ultrasound and the baby inside her. Everything seems normal, but something changes. Take a look. Okay, hopefully this isn't too cold. No, it's okay. <sighs> there he is. He's definitely a growing boy, that's for sure. And you're both looking really good. Oh, I love hearing that. Let's get some measurements to see exactly, exactly how much he's grown. <gasps> what was that? I don't know. I've never seen that before. Maybe something to do with the power. Oh. Okay. Um, this is a bit strange. What? What's strange? Nothing to worry about or anything. Just having some trouble finding the baby all of a sudden. Maybe the machine messed up? Possibly. But I can still see everything else. It's just not picking up the baby for some reason. H have this ever happened before? Um, well, sometimes babies can move into certain positions that are hard to see. But, but, but you can't see my baby at all? I'm looking. Don't worry, he, he's definitely here. You know what? Why don't we just see if we can borrow another machine, okay? There has to be something wrong with this one. I'll be right back. Um, okay. 
The last thing we see is a newspaper article about our mother in this video after her unborn child disappeared. The body of the article is pretty blurry, but we can definitely see the headline. Tiffany Crisady, age 29, school teacher. Let's look back at that description. Do you know what they did up there? These are the consequences. Well, the first sentence could be referencing Mount Greylock, as the phrase, up there, is a common way to reference mountains and hills. Also, we have seen Mount Greylock referenced quite a few times now. And the second sentence is talking about consequences. Well, watching an unborn human disappear from their mother's womb is a pretty awful consequence, but did you hear the nurse in the audio? They were talking to a supervisor as if they had seen this before. And this could be explained by another clue you may have missed. When that weird distortion came over the ultrasound, we actually are shown two images for a single frame each. The first was this. Bizarre events leave Berkshires in terror, authorities mute which proves that this strange occurrence was not the only one to happen in Berkshire County. And the second image is this, a mask, but who is behind it? Is it one of the violent suspects roaming the woods? Or could this be a thought form Simeodyne created? Speaking of Simeodyne, let's see if we can learn more about them in the next video, Sleeping Dogs. The description of which reads, There came a red flash as it pitched from heaven. Corruption wrought truth. 0707. I really don't have a clue what this could be referring to. It sounds like a quote from a novel or a poem or maybe even a Bible. But even after doing some hardcore investigating, I didn't find where this came from. So let me know in the comments if it sounds familiar to you. Also, we got a code, 0707. This could be a citation to the quote above, or it could be some passcode for something in the future. But we'll keep it as a clue for now. The video begins and immediately we are shown an intro to a lecture given by Dr. Bernard Hayes. But this took place in 1981, which would have been earlier than the Unit 13 Thought Form video which was made in 1993. That video said the government program reached out to a professor to lead the Thought Form project. And this must be him prior to Simeodyne and Unit 13. Humanity has stood tirelessly So Dr. Hayes definitely has some lofty goals for his research, and eventually for Unit 13's project. And also that speech was really really badass. But our video cuts to a Simeodyne video that at the bottom I'm pretty sure says 1987, which means this was before the invention of the thought form machine. As the video continues, we hear a familiar automated voice. 
Take a listen. Welcome back, user. Frank Porter. Please enter your credentials. Credential requirement bypassed by system administrator. Greetings, and no user ID. Welcome to Simeodyne USA's virtual message assistant, for user. Project director, Frank Porter. Establishing custom telephone message settings. Sender, Paul Morelli, Ev. The Morelli Construction and Mining Company. Dates of receipt ranging from March 24th, 1987, to March 30th, 1987. Beginning playback of your messages. Message 1. March 20th. So before we go through these messages, let's decipher what we are seeing. So this is the virtual message assistant for the Simeodyne network. And we are looking at this as if we are this project leader named Frank Porter. Apparently Simeodyne and this project leader hired a construction and mining company called Morelli for work. And what these messages are, are that contractor's owner named Paul trying to contact the Simeodyne project leader, Dr. Porter. Message 1. March 24th, 11.14 a.m. Hey Frank, it's Paul Morello. We ran into somewhat of an issue today. We came across these tunnels inside the mountain, pretty deep in, but uh, well, this is going to sound a little crazy, but he told me to call if anything strange came up, and uh, I figured this qualifies. People have been here before. Some obviously man-made shit in there, like carvings and stone. This shit looks ancient, like real old. I took a crew in to look through it, but since part of the tunnels caved in some time ago, we're going to just have to bust through it regardless. But I still wanted to make you aware of it. Anyways, I'll keep you moving. Thanks. A mountain, you say. And this takes place before 1993, and takes place before the unborn infant disappeared in its mother's womb. And if Max Headroom was on in 1987 to 1989, this message may have been sent prior to that emergency broadcast. So Simeodyne is tunneling into Mount Greylock, and the miners have discovered something ancient inside the mountain. Message 2. March 25th, 7.38am. Hey Frank, it's Paul. Just calling to tell you the day might be a bit slower than usual. Unfortunately, a number of the crew are sick as dogs. Not, uh, not really sure what kind of stomach bugs going around or what, but we'll do our best to pick up slack. I'm calling in some guys who have a day off, so uh, hopefully things will get a little closer to normal, you know? That being said, I don't know how the hell this happened, but the section of the tunnel here I caved in is clear. The tunnel's been wired up with a few lights, too. Wanted to see if maybe you sent someone in while we were off shift. My crew said you didn't, but, you know, I didn't see anybody else either, so... But a few of the guys said they'd seen something running around in the woods surrounding the site. I figured it's probably a deer or whatever, but seeing all the ruckus we're making out here, you know? But they all insisted it was something else. Something like a, a real tall man. It might just be some environmentalist moron trying to cause some shit, but... You know, he ain't done nothing, so I told him to keep focus on the project. For safety's sake, we're going to avoid the tunnel until I hear back from you. Alright, bye now. Message 3. March 25th, 4.56 p.m. Hey Frank, it's Paul again. The guy you sent out to take photos just left, but uh... Well, he seemed totally fine when he got here, but... We practically had to carry him back to his car when he was done. I don't know if he caught whatever's going around, but... Figured you should know. Also, we found some really old shit down there, Frank. Now, I ain't no historian, but we got a guy on the crew who used to do archaeology work or whatever, and I don't know. But I guess there's some old artifacts down there, like weapons and trinkets and whatever. I'll have him draft up a report for you and send it your way, because I feel like he'd be interested, and he can explain all this shit better than I could anyways. His name's Arnold Rivers. That's about it. All right. There is something in the woods that is watching the miners. Could it be something similar to the figure that was staring at our cameraman earlier? 
And who is going in and lighting the tunnels for the miners? Is it this creature, or maybe it's Simeodyne not telling our friend Paul what is really going on? Well, maybe it wasn't Simeodyne because they sent a project member to the worksite, and it seems whatever the miners have dug up has completely shocked the member. March 26, 1.03 p.m. Frank, something ain't right here. Crew's getting worse, more sick. I, I feel okay so far, but I, I don't know how long that's gonna last. I saw that thing the guys have been talking about last night, stalking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. A a anyways, just, just call me back as soon as you can, Frank. Message 5. March 27th, 12.10 p.m. All our food is rotten, totally spoiled and covered in maggots. It was perfectly fine and stored. There wasn't any problems with the generator, even if we lost power. I mean, it's the end of March. All our food looks like it's been left out in the heat for weeks. No idea what's going on. Please call me back. Message 6. March 27th, 4.02 p.m. It's Paul. We saw it again. Something out here with us. It's in the woods. And it's... It's watching us, goddammit. It ain't no animal either. Who are you guys gonna put up those fancy hunting cameras and see if we can catch anything? Maybe locals fucking with us? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But yeah, anyways, I, I just... Message 7. Date and time unavailable. Message... Message 8. March 27th, 1013 p.m. What are these things Paul and his archaeology friend found? Native American artifacts? Maybe a ceremonial gravesite? 
Looks like Simeodyne wants to capture whatever Paul and his team are seeing in the woods because they set up hunting cameras where one catches something pass by that distorts the footage. This looks very much like the distortion in the second video, and it looks like it's morphing into shapes. Whatever it is, it can affect electronics, and perhaps can even be alive. Message 9. March 30th, time unavailable. There, at the end, the hunting camera caught something we have seen before. That mask. Whatever this creature is, it's the one in the woods Paul's team found, and it appears that it was observing Paul while they were tunneling into Mount Greylock, perhaps even setting up lights to help them uncover the old ruins faster. But whatever Simeodyne and the miners have discovered will release some sort of disease onto the miners in the mountain. Could this discovery that Paul talked about be what that description earlier was talking about? Is this what they did on the mountain to cause all the consequences? Regardless, what is that creature in the mask? Is this a thought form or something else that seems to roam Mount Greylock? Maybe Simeodyne created this, but why would it attack the miners working for the company then? Our next video is called Back to Normal, and immediately we are shown a news broadcast on Channel 13 with the host, Don Wright. And we can probably guess this is the news station for Berkshire County. Authorities continue to investigate the recent crime wave that swept across northern Berkshire County, with many of its residents in a state of anxiety and panic. It was two weeks ago when the emergency broadcast system was engaged to warn residents to secure their homes due to the activity of a group of individuals who had been targeting and breaking into people's homes. Authorities have since confirmed that the attacks were, in fact, part of an organized criminal effort and have been attributed to a local anti-American militia group operating out of western Massachusetts called... Police have made numerous arrests in connection to... Militia and officials continue to release statements to assure the public that they are safe once again. We've seen a lot of credible information over the past couple of weeks, and the investigation is still ongoing. We'll get closer to this one. So let's look at our timeline. We saw the emergency broadcast and this news report is taking place two weeks later. But we have a significant development in the story. The break-ins were being done by an anti-American militia group hidden in the mountains. But the recording distorts when the name of this group is said. Thankfully, due to the continued efforts of law enforcement, life has been able to return back to normal. Back, back to normal. To n turn back to normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. Normal for residents of Berkshire County.
this recording of the news broadcast is anything but normal, and the hijacker of this news broadcast agrees by saying liar at the end. It appears a information battle has started in Berkshire County. On one side you have the police and the government and probably Simeodyne with them trying to keep the peace and keep citizens from questioning the mountain militia. And on the other side we have some sort of rebel force against the state breaking into people's homes. And I want to say the implication here is that they were also watching Paul and the miners while they worked. But remember those clips of the masked creature? If these are real humans in the mountains, are they working with it? Or is the government lying when they say it's a human militia group? I have a lot more thoughts on this as well, but we have two more videos to watch and then we'll put this story together. The next tape is called Old Odd Ends and is the longest in the series. It begins exactly where this hijacked broadcast left off, setting us two weeks since the emergency broadcast and the attacks on innocent people. It seems the broadcast station was aware of the hijacking and they quickly cut to technical difficulties with the familiar veterans tower in the background. We then cut to what looks like a conversation between the network's executives who are shocked and angry at what occurred. Take a listen. Well that broadcast went completely tits up, didn't it? I've been getting chewed out by our asshole CIA liaison for the past two hours. What the fuck happened? We're looking into it, sir, but we experienced no issues with the broadcast in our end, so our engineers believe that the signal was hijacked before we were reaching the transmitter, but once we started receiving phone calls from viewers, we switched to a backup transmitter. But by then, the hijacker had already said everything they wanted to say, hadn't they? Mm, yes, sir. What a complete... Fuck up! They made us look like a fucking joke! And sure our most popular show. Speaking of which, Don, where the fuck is he? I cannot get hold of him and he needs to get in here and read a statement to help clean up this fucking mess. Uh, well, we've been trying to reach him. We've called him multiple times. We've tried his pager. We've asked around to see if anyone's heard from him, but nothing. Right now we've got Gerald standing in for him tonight. Have you been to his house? Uh, well, no, I just thought that maybe he'd, he'd be upset if I did that. So. Get in your fucking car and go to his fucking house! I don't care if you kick down his front door and drag him here by his ear! You bring him into the studio! Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Rosenbaum. Of course, I'll do that right now. There's some real powerful people depending on us right now. They need us to manage the response to these events to let the public know what's going on, and the last thing we need is it going wider than it already fucking has. So do what you need to do, or I'm gonna replace you with some producers who actually know how to produce a fucking show. Our video then cuts again, and it seems we are accessing a new tape from that automated computer system earlier. Whatever is being accessed is so confidential that the computer thinks it was destroyed, and whoever has been accessing this archive has some top secret clearance that they are able to recover the file despite the system's warning. And we cut to this, a recording done by a man named Eugene Rivers. And if we remember, he was the miner that Paul said had archaeological experience and that he left the dig site after the discovery of the artifacts. The date is April 7th, 1987, which would be right after the disaster at the dig site that we saw. Warning, anomalous file detected. This file should not exist. Are you sure you wish to proceed? Opening file. Arnold Rivers personal log. Final. My name is Arnold Eugene Rivers. The date is April 8th, 1987, about a quarter past nine at night. I was involved in the Morelli construction project at Mount Greylock. I was hired due to my background in anthropology and archaeology. I've worked to excavate a number of different historical sites. 
Paul Morelli took me on after securing a government contract for the Greylock Project. I'm recording this because I believe my life is in danger, and I likely don't have a lot of time left, so I need to leave some kind of record of my findings. On March 24th, our crew came across tunnels in the mountain that held a multitude of ancient markings and artifacts. On March 25th, Paul cleared the interior of the mountain and asked me, accompanied by a small crew, to look through the tunnels and record notes on what I was able to recognize. I was then to report to one of the project directors, named Frank Porter, to offer my perspective on our findings. I kept this to myself at the time, but what we discovered in that mountain was not normal. Not only did I see the impact it was having on the crew, but certain aspects of my findings did not make any sense. Many of the artifacts were pre-colonial. Some were from Native American tribes, but there were other artifacts. Some were so American, and others were shockingly Clovis in nature. Finding Clovis artifacts here means that people have been coming to Mount Greylock since at least 11,000 BCE. But that's not all, no. There are artifacts I found that could potentially be from even earlier, Paleo-American cultures that we have yet to even begin studying. Then, there were artifacts and writings left by the cultures that were pre-Columbian in nature. Transoceanic contacts prior to Columbus reaching the Americas has always been largely a theory, but, but the artifacts in this mountain, they, they prove it. Ancient Chinese, Arabic, Indian, Roman, Spanish, Viking, even ancient Greek and Egyptian. Our findings that they alone would change world history as we know it today. I'll admit, the anthropologist in me was thrilled. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I figured it had to be a hoax, but I'm confident that it's all authentic. But my excitement was soon replaced with a looming fear and anxiety. How could such a place be so important to so many cultures for so long? There must be something immense here. Whatever it was, well, that's why I left the project. The tunnels all connected to a series of chambers deep into the interior of the mountain. That's where a majority of the relics were found. There were old baskets of herbs and spices, pottery, weapons and armor, talismans, and other religious items, countless other things, but all of it was there purposely as offerings. <laughs> Billions of years ago, when our planet was still mostly fire and rock, that a Mars-sized planet that had been drifting through our solar system collided directly with the Earth. The impact was so powerful and violent that the rogue planet was blown into countless pieces of debris. This debris collected to form our moon. Many of the pieces of the unknown planet remain inside the Earth to this day.
There's something in that mountain. Something people of countless cultures over the history of our planet have been worshipping. But I don't know why. But I can feel it. Whatever's down there, I can feel it. It was like being trapped in a fever dream. I swear I could hear a voice and even felt compelled to go further. To speak to whatever's down there. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I haven't been right since I, I keep hearing this droning in my head. Ceaseless all day and night. I, I can't sleep. Just droning. Always droning. But, but that, that doesn't matter right now. I informed Mr. Porter in my report that the archaeological findings in the mountain are of monumental historical importance and that there is certainly more to be discovered. And I recommended discontinuing construction there. But it's not as though I have any authority over this project. I fully expected to be ignored. Mr. Porter called me on the evening of March 28th and we spoke on the phone briefly. It was as I thought. He disregarded my concerns. I informed him that I wasn't going to return to the site. He insisted I did, said I was a valuable asset to the project, even offered me a substantial raise, and wanted me to lead a specifically organized team that would clear the tunnels of artifacts before excavation would continue. I, quote unquote, could be responsible for the biggest historical finding of all time, he said. I refuse again. I won't put a price on my sanity or my health, especially after seeing what was happening to the crew. So that was a lot, but let's push on before we decipher all of this. Our video then cuts to the beginning of a report on the minor crew after what happened at the dig site. Without a doubt, the military scooped the infected up and made them disappear. But the question is, was Simeodyne involved? But let's see what this disease and the ancient ruins did to these unfortunate workers. Morelli Greylock event, group C, survivor data. Profile for patient B3590. Rockford, Thomas. L formations. Notes. Communicative. Patient prone to spontaneous violent outbursts. Treatment of heavy sedation recommended. Only communicate while patient is restrained or via intercom. Now loading. Profile for patient. B9231. Washington, Samuel. Al formations. Notes. Communicative. Patient suffers from constant state of severe paranoia and delusions, resulting in unpredictable violent outbursts. Standard treatment ineffective. High dose xylazine is recommended. Only communicate while patient is restrained or via intercom. Now loading. Profile for patient. B6670. Herrera, Ramon. Now formations. Notes. Uncommunicative. Patient appears to be in catatonic state. Warning, patient may sit up very suddenly, without provocation, to projectile vomit at any staff in area. Patient's vomit is extremely corrosive and emits nerve gas. All treatments ineffective. Studies must be conducted with full anti-corrosive gear and air purifying respirator equipped on all staff involved. Now loading. Profile for patient. B8816. Fleming, Charles. Al formations. Notes. Uncommunicative. Warning. Patient will attack on site. Do not interact. Immunity to pain. Patient exhibits cannibalistic tendencies. All treatments ineffective. Immediate euthanasia recommended. Now loading. Profile for patient. B4041. Oakhurst, Scott. Al formations. Notes. Communicative. Communicate with caution. Warning, patient actively pretends to be benevolent and friendly. Strong homicidal and cannibalistic tendencies. Killed and partially consumed six staff members on April 6th, 87. 
Patient laughed hysterically during the attack. All treatments ineffective. Immediate euthanasia or permanent restraint for further study recommended. Now loading. Profile for patient. B7992. Kowalski, Edward. Now formations. Notes. Communicative. Hazardous. Warning, patient possesses inhuman power of suggestion and influence over others. Do not interact. All treatments ineffective. Immediate euthanasia recommended. Now loading. Profile for patient. B1584. Rafferty, John. Now formations. Notes. Uncommunicative. Hazardous. Patient appears to be deceased. No vital signs. Patient's body not decomposing. Warning, staff have become ill after even brief time spent in patient's room. Illness disregards protective suiting. Immediate quarantine required for all victims. Mortality rate post-exposure currently 92%. Survivor subject to rapid physical and mental malformations. All treatments ineffective. Immediate remote euthanasia recommended. This is unlike any normal disease, and it appears to be affecting the miners differently to each one. Some are just crazy people that can be sedated, and others are zombie-like in appearance. They are all violent, but some are still communicating while in captivity, which makes them even more lethal. Some have become cannibals who revel in consuming human flesh, and enjoy manipulating people to get near them to strike. They aren't just sick, they are entirely inhuman, monsters created by whatever lies within Mount Greylock. But let's continue where we return to the recording of Rivers talking about the discovery. I consider myself incredibly lucky to not be in that condition right now. Oddly, he quickly accepted my second refusal wished me luck in my future endeavors, but before I could say anything else, he hung up. But it seemed I'd made the right choice. I heard something awful happened up at Mount Greylock, and then simultaneously, there were all of these things that have been happening around the mountain. The home invasions, the dead bodies that fell from the sky over Cheshire, the pregnancy phenomena, so many other unexplainable things. They all must be related. And I've been trying to figure out how. I've connected with a local investigator who's been trying to get to the bottom of this. I've shared with him everything I have, though I feel that I've been being watched. I feel a looming threat that I can't really explain. Would the government really send someone to kill me over this? I feel like I'm paranoid, like I've lost some of my mind. But I came home from the grocery store the other day and my front door was unlocked. And I know I had locked it before I left. I scanned my entire house for traces of anything, but found nothing out of the ordinary. I even checked and replaced all of the light bulbs. <laughs> oh, God. Saying that loud like this, it makes me realize how crazy I sound. I've always been a rational man. There's a logical explanation behind everything. Well, I'm glad that I put all of this into a recording. Perhaps that was what I needed to snap me out of this. Honestly, I feel much better just talking about it. <gasps> this can't be. Oh my god, that's my basement door. No, 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 no. Camcoder. Oh, where is the damn camcoder? There it is. Thank god. inside my bedroom closet. I'm going to keep the tape recorder running and I'm hiding in here with my files. If something happens to me and you find any tapes or files somehow, please bring it to the investigator, Jimmy Melgram of North Adams. That goes for this video footage as well.
Come on out, it's the police. And with that, our video ends, and this last segment has really opened up a whole can of worms in this series. Rivers is dead, but his files and this recording survived. And perhaps it's finally been revealed who is accessing the archive from the very beginning, a private investigator named Jim Melgren of North Adams. And Jim isn't just investigating the event at Mount Greylock because Rivers also mentions the strange happenings around Berkshire County. Just like that newspaper clip said, the missing unborn children, the home invasions, but he mentions something else, bodies falling from the sky. And unless I missed it, I don't think we have been shown that event happening yet, so that might be teasing what's to come. And who has killed our archaeologists? The masked monster that can become invisible and change shape. Like a calling card, it has appeared at important deaths in this series. It appeared when the baby disappeared. It was there when the miners were becoming sick in the mountains. It was in the second video near our cameraman, and it seems to be capable of messing with electronics. Which leads us to the most recent upload the ninth video titled, Trojan Technology. Our video begins with the automated voice opening up another file from the archive, except this one is from a radio broadcast all the way back in 1963, and we know that 101 WRAV is the same news outlet as the one in the 80s. Apparently in 1963, this is the year when the US government began the National Access Initiative. Let's take a look. Accessing GBS properties, 101, WRAV, FM, radio station. Date of broadcast, December 13, 1963. Segment, announcement of the National Access Initiative. Beginning playback. In one of his first acts after his historic succession, President Lyndon B. Johnson's administration has announced an upcoming program that will revolutionize communication and bring critical home electronics into every American household. The National Access Initiative, as it's been named, is a program designed to ensure that all citizens have equal access to vital communication tools and ways to stay informed, fostering connectivity, security, and unity across the nation. Under this groundbreaking initiative, eligible American households will receive packages containing a myriad of electronics so that citizens may stay properly engaged with one another and remain knowledgeable regarding important events. The electronics such as telephones, televisions, and radios. These packages will also include items aimed at keeping families safe with devices such as smoke alarms, burglar alarms, and even flashlights. These things will empower individuals to not only stay involved in their communities, but to remain prepared for any emergency as well. President Johnson himself was quoted as saying that in this era of progress and innovation, it is crucial for every American to have the tools necessary as they navigate the challenges of modern life in an era of ever-increasing technological dependence. These electronics packages are being made available to American households through a partnership with world-renowned technology manufacturer, Simeodyne USA. So Simeodyne has existed far longer than the 70s and 80s, and back then they were an electronics manufacturer contracted by the government. Our video then cuts to some newspaper articles of the JFK assassination, and then a security camera's footage of a fancy room from 1966 for a moment before the radio broadcast returns. 
Again, the video cuts to another security camera, and we can assume this is the same house in the same year. But the next camera we see is even stranger. It is a year later in 1967, and we can see what looks like someone sleeping in a bed. Has made them a household name, and their gracious contribution to this initiative ensures that the devices provided will be of the highest quality. further enhancing the experience and benefits for American citizens. When asked for a quote during a press conference earlier this week, President of Simeodyne USA, Percival C. Rothwell, had a lot to say. The National Access Initiative represents a milestone in our nation's journey towards progress and inclusivity. So we have a name of the president of Simeodyne. Percival C. Rothwell. So let's see what he has to say about the new initiative. Again, our video cuts to another security cam footage of what looks like a kitchen. It's a reflection of the American government and Simeodyne USA's unwavering commitment to empower every American citizen, regardless of age, location, or income with the tools and resources needed to thrive in the electronic age. Let's pause again. So Rothwell is clearly a very powerful elitist, as he is involved closely with the President and the Department of Defense. But it looks like Rothwell and Simeodyne tried to start the NAI program under President Kennedy, but Kennedy rejected the idea and threatened to expose the truth behind it to the media. But did you catch what Rothwell also said? Semiodyne wasn't the only organization that was angry with JFK. Operation Northwoods was mentioned, and for a brief synopsis, that was a plan the CIA came up with that would have involved the CIA shooting down an American airline plane full of citizens just for the military to blame the Russians and attack Cuba. Fortunately, this insane and treasonous plan was rejected by Kennedy. 
As for the Federal Reserve, there was a relatively unknown executive order called Number 11110. This order stripped the Federal Reserve of its ability to charge interest on loans given to the federal government. You can imagine this did not go over well at all with corporations in almost every sector tied to the government who relied on the interest on those loans. Regardless of all of this, this is playing on the conspiracy theory that the entrenched bureaucracy was responsible for JFK's assassination. And with the Federal Reserve, the CIA, and Simeodyne all furious with Kennedy, it seems this version of US history is also going to contain that assassination. Another thing Rothwell says is that he is the great-great-grandson of the company's founder, which begs the question, how long has Simeodyne been around? Our video cuts to another camera's footage which is focused on a sign that looks handwritten. It says, The NAI program was a trap. They are watching, they are listening. Fuck LBJ, fuck Simeodyne, I won't be your lab rat anymore. Also, notice the date on the footage. This was captured in 1990, three years after the home intruder incident. We cut to a new camera and we can see a silhouette of a human in front of a closet. This was captured in 1993, just another three years later. So could this be a thought form created by Simeodyne's machine? After Rothwell's message, we see a group of figures standing in the woods. Their white faces look similar to the mask we have repeatedly seen, so could these be the monsters that many of our characters have ran into? Or are these the anti-Simeodyne militia group that is living in the mountain range? And this, this is only the beginning. We have so much more planned so that Americans can all truly be equal in our society. Security, connectivity, accessibility. It is our belief that it is these three factors that make America the best country in the world. also stated that these monumental benefits won't only be made available to American households, but to police and fire departments, schools, and to small businesses as well. The Johnson administration has stated that while they are going to begin launching this landmark program right away, it will first be made available only in select areas as construction crews from coast to coast prepare to establish important infrastructure that will support the National Access Initiative program. So the NAI is even larger than just electronic devices for American homes. It's devices for every sector of the government. Rothwell and Simeodyne will have security access to everything, which is probably a major reason JFK rejected such a program. Next, our tape cuts back to security footage of a computer, but this time we are in 1994. initiative program.
Johnson administration went on to say that their After our radio broadcast, we get one more security footage from 1987. Take a listen. Will be mailed informational packets regarding the National Access Initiative, including information on how to apply as the program becomes available in our area. You've reached Alex Marsh and Tiffany Crisaldi. We're not able to get to the phone, so please leave a message after the tone and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Alex Marsh and Tiffany Crisaldi. These are both names we have seen. Tiffany was the pregnant woman whose unborn child disappeared during the ultrasound and Alex Marsh was the new employee that received the orientation tape, meaning Alex is an employee of Simeodyne, and they appear to be a married couple who were expecting a child, and unfortunately, their child was taken from them. And with that, our last video ends, and this one showed us a lot for this series. First, let's take a nice long look at that thought form or tulpa that attacked at the end. I believe this is meant to be a little girl who thinks she is talking to an imaginary friend, only for her to actually become a victim. The next thing of note is we now have context to how Simeodyne has all of these recordings in their archive that we have seen through the series. The NAI program allow them to spy on every home, office, business, public service, in the entire country. Nothing can be kept secret from them. And we saw this throughout the last video. We are looking into random people's homes but when we got to camera footage from the 1980s and beyond, we can see where Semiodyne was beginning to capture thought forms in people's homes. And that sign we saw, that was placed in front of the camera, and whoever wrote it knew how much control the NAI gave Semiodyne, calling himself a lab rat. This phrase creates a whole new possibility that is far darker than just a company spying on people's homes. Remember, this occurred in 1990, three years after the mining incident. What if Simeodyne was using innocent people's homes to conduct experiments regarding the thought forms? And the only escape out of their hands is to flee to the woods which even though they don't have electronics, the woods aren't that safe either. 
The next thing to point out is a single frame that appeared during Rothwell's interview. Going back to that frame, we get a close-up of one of the figures in the woods, which now looking closer, this could be the same mask we have seen before. And it begs the question, is this a thought form or are these the anti-Simeodyne militia group? We'll talk about them more when we put this timeline together, but for now I have to say it is a really cool design for them. The last thing I want to point out is the name of the video, Trojan Technology. This is clearly a reference to the Trojan horse and it matches perfectly because Simeodyne has offered a gift to the American people, but in reality it is secretly a trap to be set if the people accept it. With the videos thoroughly analyzed, let's try to put these pieces together on a timeline using all the dates and events we were shown. And we'll theorize the gaps in between, even though I'm confident there will be more to this story in the future. But let's start. The Greylock Tapes is a fascinating web that someone like me can really sink their teeth into. And they do something that I love in analog horror. It provides context to why these tapes exist and who would want to watch them. A lot of series leave this ambiguous and just say it's the method to deliver the media, but this series has woven the tapes into the fabric of the story because the tapes being watched exist in the world and on our timeline. So let's look at that timeline because we can definitely start tying these events together. And I think the best way to tell this story is to start with the private investigator that Arnold Rivers hired to investigate Simeodyne, Jim Melgren, who I believe right now is the one who has entered the Simeodyne facility to uncover the secrets of the company after some destructive event occurred. That would put us here at the end of our timeline at an unknown year past the events in 1987 and security camera footage of 1994. We don't know the date he has accessed these tapes yet, but he has been investigating this case for at least seven years now, and we can speculate that he is probably a local of Berkshire County. I also have a theory that instead of it being Jim, it could also be this Alex Marsh because it would explain how he has the codes to access the archive. But I still think that this is gonna be Jim, his part in all of this began in 1987 when he was contacted by Arnold Rivers, who had just left the minor job right before the tragedy. Spooked by the strange happenings around the mountain, Arnold and Jim began collecting clues regarding the mountain shortly after the mining disaster. Which takes us to our second video called To The Mountain. I think this is Jim's trip to Greylock in order to search for clues to all the strangeness. In this video, he comes close to an unknown entity that messes with his camera, radio, and onboard microphone, making his voice distorted and hard to understand. But with everything we've seen in this series, what we have deciphered from what was said kinda makes more sense. Words like human skull, animal carcass, emergency, Mount Greylock. Jim is here in the woods to find out what the emergency broadcast was talking about, but he has discovered that something supernatural is occurring that's more than just a militia group, which leads us into the footage in the fourth tape, and I believe this is a continuation of that same night in 1987, and this is Jim breaking into someone's house which is why he scopes it out and why he looks out the window on the second floor. This whole adventure on the mountain is occurring at the same time of the emergency broadcast, but at the end of the video, a hand begins to climb in. So either one of these thought forms or I guess a militia man intruder is after Jim or even kills Jim by the end of the fourth video. But 1987 is an important year in our timeline, besides Jim. We also know this is when the strange events begin occurring in Berkshire County. We watch Tiffany and Alex's baby get stolen, and Arnold River mentions bodies falling from the sky. 
And all of these happenings, including the emergency broadcast, all occur right after the mining expedition into Mount Greylock. And according to my understanding, this is what Simeodyne has been building up to. They knew what was hidden inside this mountain and wanted the mining crew to open it. And we even have a name of the executive in charge of the expedition, Frank Porter, who knew of what would happen to the miners once the ancient ruins were opened, which is why Simeodyne scooped them up and contained them for research all except for one who left the dig site after the discovery, Arnold Rivers, an archaeologist who was shocked and frightened by the ruins. Frank Porter even attempts to keep Arnold at the site, tempting him with being famous for the discovery, because Simeodyne doesn't care about the public finding out. They knew all along what they were uncovering. Because if Arnold stays, he can get infected and be taken into Simeodyne's custody. But with him loose, it could leak to the media of what they discovered. Which leads us here, all the way to the beginning of our timeline. What are the ruins in Mount Greylock? Well, they are beyond ancient, and more strangely, every advanced civilization in human history has made a pilgrimage to this mountain and based on Arnold's study, it looked like they were partaking in some sort of human sacrifice. For a demon, for an alien, we don't know. What we do know is that something supernatural has been watching that mountain, and this leads us to the militia group mentioned by the local news. I don't believe these are humans, the entity that watched the miners work. This image of these cloaked and masked people in the woods. What if these are all the same? We were taught that thought forms take an enormous amount of spiritual energy to conjure. So what if these thought forms that watch and protect the ancient ruins were created by these ancient ruins? And they are watching as Simeodyne and their miners begin to open it. But let's fill out this timeline a little more. We know that Simeodyne has been around for a majority of US history since the CEO in the 1960s says his great great grandfather started the company. And by the 1960s, Simeodyne had grown more advanced in electronic manufacturing and now stands as one of the most powerful companies hired by the US government their influence being on the same scale as the CIA and the Federal Reserve which leads them to present the NAI program to President Kennedy, offering to put electronic devices in every home in the country. Kennedy, who looked at this and probably realized that having an enormous company capturing all of the surveillance footage in the nation was probably an overstep in basic privacy rights, which led to its CEO pulling strings between other powerful bureaucrats leading to Kennedy being assassinated at the request of Simeodyne, and President LBJ immediately signed the NAI into action. With cameras being put into every home, Simeodyne began spying, turning people's homes into research laboratories. But some people, who were probably labeled as insane conspiracy theorists by their community, escaped their homes, like what our sign said which was probably made by one of these conspiracy theorists. This leads us to 1981. Simeodyne is still growing, but their goals are now set on something new. How to conjure, control, and maybe even weaponize human consciousness. And who better to lead the company in this direction than a professor of human thought and consciousness? Enter Professor Bernard T. Hayes, who gave a speech at a Human Thought Symposium in 1981. We can assume that at some point not long after this event, he would be approached by Simeodyne and the government to begin studying thought forms for Project Stargate, which in 1993 Simeodyne was able to produce and control thought forms for the government using the Thought Form Manifestor. They have succeeded in creating their own thought forms similar to the ones on Mount Greylock. 
And we saw in 1994 security footage of what these created entities are capable of by appearing and attacking people in their home. That leaves us one final gap between Simeodyne's beginning of Project Stargate in 1981 to the mining expedition in 1987. Unfortunately, we don't know much what happens in this time frame, but we can theorize based on what happened in 1987. I believe Simeodyne knew about these ruins. They knew about the entities on the mountain, and they knew what would happen to those miners that uncovered it. Now, there are still a lot of questions, like did the miners turn into thought forms, or did Simeodyne do something to them in containment? Also, what power in these ruins helped Simeodyne create the thought form manifester, and what would the government even use that for? But since the discovery, a war has begun in Berkshire County. The entities of the mountain are now enraged, breaking into people's homes, stealing unborn children, and I guess making people fall from the sky? And Simeodyne is covering it all up by labeling them as anti-government militiamen. Which is why during the hijacking of the local news, it said liar next to the news host. The news station was told by Simeodyne to call the militiamen, and the news was told to say that the crisis is over and life in Berkshire County is back to normal, even though their host was killed by these entities, proving they are still a real threat to the people of the county. And here is our final timeline. So what's next? I think we're going to follow either Jim or Alex Marsh in these next few videos, and I'm sure we'll also get videos providing more context of that 1981 to 1987 gap and what Simeodyne knew about these ancient ruins. But I really want to learn more about the ancient ruins because I think based on the pastor on the radio, this is going to be some satanic temple. And the reveal is going to be that Semiodyne has made a deal with the devil in order to create thought forms. I would also like to see something about these people falling from the sky. I think that would be like a really cool camera shot, like from outside of a public building. Just like a normal street for 10 minutes and then boom, a body just slams the pavement. Regardless, Jim or Alex or whoever is accessing this archive is revealing far more than they bargained for. What happened at Simeodyne to cause the main computer system to be shut down? And how much more fallout is going to occur since the discovery in Mount Greylock? But for now, tell me what you think in the comments. Are there any clues you have spotted or some other theories of what is happening in this series? And be sure to like this video and subscribe for more content. And if you want to get your name at the end of the video, why not support Pagan Valley on Patreon? With that, this has been Pagan Valley, and I wish you all a good evening.